our warmest regards to you for the journey that you're about to take. It's not an easy journey and we hope and pray and we know that our ancestors will be with you and guide you because we have a powerful message to send to the whole world on a tiny little board and this one man. Norm Pan and I'm from originally from Coniston, Ontario outside of Sudbury. I live in Squamish, BC now. The sport of stand-up paddleboarding is is new to Canadian uh, paddlers, Canadian people. Uh, originally it uh, started in Hawaii. Uh, I started paddling about three years ago. Originally started working on the coast here in 2000 when I was hired at King Pacific Lodge. Um, since that time, uh, I've spent a lot of time in the community of, of Hartley Bay over those years as a, as a basketball coach, a teacher, working with uh, student mentor programs with the communities there. And in, uh, as a result of the work, I was adopted into the community in 2006 and given the name to Amlan, which means uh, steerman of the canoe. So it was a huge honor that was given to me. Um, and, and it also carried a big responsibility. Uh, Helen Clifton is a matriarch and leader within the community of, of Hartley Bay. I've learned uh, a lot from, from Helen Clifton. She came in every Wednesday and spoke to the kids about their culture and tradition. And uh, it was very inspiring to listen to. She's an amazing storyteller. And so not only was she inspiring the students at that time, but she was really inspiring me. And I felt this really huge responsibility to want to do something. So she was a huge inspiration. We both picked up a newspaper clipping and it referred to a DVD called The Black Wave, The Legacy of the Exxon Valdez. And so I ordered it immediately. I watched that and uh, became very emotional. I actually broke down after I watched the film because I felt really bad for the people in Alaska. And I'd said to myself, this has already happened up there. And this is pretty much exactly what they want to do here on our coastline. They want to build that pipeline and they, then they want to take these tankers right, you know, basically past my front window where I was watching the film. And I said, no. Enbridge has proposed the Northern Gateway project, which wants to take oil from the tar sands of Alberta along a 1,200 kilometer long pipeline to Kitimat. Then they will want to load up 225 tankers a year and take that oil through the Great Bear Rainforest, past these coastal communities, out across Hecate Strait, past Haida Gwaii, on its way to China. I knew I was going to do something uh, and it was to paddle the tanker route. I wanted to highlight the traditional food harvesting areas of the First Nations people along the tanker route, and I wanted to document the wildlife through the Great Bear Rainforest and see for myself uh, what was going to be affected if there was going to be an oil spill. The Gulf spill happened in April, and I couldn't believe what I was watching. Uh, the lack of response, uh, people not even knowing how much oil was spilling into the Gulf on a daily basis and then not knowing how to stop it. What's the status of that at, at, at the moment, Admiral? Because we, we had heard predictions from some officials that as much as 336,000 gallons of crude could be leaking from the wellhead each and every day. Are you saying that right now there's no oil, no crude oil that's leaking from the wellhead? I am saying that there's no crude oil at this time leaking from the wellhead. Shannon is my youngest sister. Uh, her role on the trip was to uh, help with uh, the media, putting up blog posts, documenting the trip. I'm Brian Huntington and I work for the Skeena Watershed Conservation Coalition in Hazleton, BC. You know, he was on Allie Howard's Skeena swim and now here he was, um, you know, going to be meeting me in Kitimat to now paddle the tanker route. One of my jobs was to be 
Norm's support boat in the water, but also to photograph and film as much of his expedition and the interactions with the landscape and with the different communities. And I thought it was amazing because Brian had never been in a sea kayak before. And uh, here he was about to get into a, a sea kayak and support me over 400 kilometers. And um, it was really incredible to have Brian on the trip with me. Stand up, baby! Day one was a very exciting day. It was uh, sunny when we woke up in Kitimat. Norm and Shannon and I were on the docks just getting boats ready to push off and uh, a few people showed up. I mean, it was quiet. If Enbridge comes here, the impact to our territory is irreparable. And I just really wish you all the best on your journey. Dolores Pollard was there and she was there to bless our expedition and um, she sang a number of songs for us that were really, really powerful songs. And, and one of the songs that she sang for us, uh, I felt, became the theme song of our expedition. When you're traveling, just remember this verse because this is what your whole journey is about and sing it. We don't need Enbridge on the Douglas. We don't need Enbridge on the Douglas. We don't need. Norm's like chomping at the bit to get paddling and get on the water and so he hit the water and just took off. Day one took us into Giltoyes and uh, Gerald Amos guided us through there. And uh, we'd come off the tanker route and he had picked us up. This was our introduction to coastal ecology, into traditional foods, and into kind of this question of what would tankers impact on the coast? He just took us through and, and probably within, you know, a time of, um, you know, maybe 30 minutes of travel, he was showing us all the areas that were important to him and, and pointing out where he had fished and where his father had taken him and, and uh, where certain fish spawn and where they get their halibut and seaweed. Without, without access to the, to the resources out here, I, I don't think our people could survive. It's, it's not about being opposed to development, it's being, it's being concerned enough to speak up about the type of development that threatens our, our lifestyle. You get people together, good shit happens. And that, I think that's what's going on. They went out that evening and harvested uh, crabs. They set the traps, they went out and gotten crabs. And so that evening, day one, here we are eating traditional foods. Uh, Dungeness wow. crab from their territory. I have always heard about the way the coast can blow up on you. And we got to see it go from calm, smooth, clear paddling to eight foot seas in 40 minutes. Even after three years of, of paddling, a lot of ocean paddling, I still uh, look back to that as the most challenging three hours that I've paddled. For three hours straight, I think he covered like a kilometer and a half. But the challenge is just uh, standing on your board. I just stopped concentrating for half a second. I was looking up at the mountain at something and then I was in before I knew it. And it had happened again. When I got onto the boat, um, after the three hours of paddling and we'd finally sort of safely gotten into the qual. I remember being on the boat and uh, it was pretty challenging conditions even in the boat. Uh, Gerald was having a tough time keeping things upright inside. I think Gerald was out there supporting Norm because he believed what he was doing. But witnessing him paddle through that, those seas that day, I think Gerald was, you know, prepared from then on out to, to, to stand by this guy. Once the guys from Hartley Bay met us, they, they took us over and they showed us where the petroglyphs were. 
And uh, I walked over there and um, there they were. There was hundreds of petroglyphs on the shoreline. The day started out nice and smooth and great conditions and really gentle outflow. And so we, we boogied out of the qual and, and got right out in the middle of Douglas Channel again. And um, on the approach to Hartley Bay, uh, one of these smaller tankers, which is going in and out of Kitimat right now, came powering down the channel. A tanker that's, you know, one third the size of these super tankers that they're proposing. Suddenly, sort of the whole trip and the whole expedition just kind of went like, like this is it. Brian and I were coming into the community of Hartley Bay. It was a really exciting time for me because it's my adopted community. Hartley Bay is a, a small coastal community. Um, probably around 180 people live in Hartley Bay. There's no roads. Uh, there's only boardwalks. It's in a stunning location at the, uh, at the end of a river that feeds out into the ocean there. It's a community um, that still harvests traditionally off the land. Uh, very strong culture, very strong, strong traditions. It's uh, the people of Hartley Bay will literally give the shirts off their back. It's a small community, but it has a really big heart. As we came around the corner, it was like a picture window opening up and the point kind of moved along the side and it was just a row of beaded blankets and regalia and the whole community laid out there with these drums. It was a really powerful moment and it literally stopped me in my tracks. I was looking at the reason why I was doing this expedition. <laughs> For coastal First Nations people, their, their identity is tied to their land. It's tied to their foods. So if you take away those, those foods, you take away their identity. The, uh, the longest day was the day we spent after leaving Hartley Bay. Uh, we started off in beautiful conditions, blue skies, flat water. Um, that day was our longest day, it was 12 hours. This area of the coast is already seen a sinking of a, a very large vessel and that was the sinking of the Queen of the North in 2006. The Queen of the North was a, a BC ferry that, that had a route from Prince Rupert uh, down through the inside passage. It uh, missed a, a slight left-hand turn and ran into the top end of Gill Island just outside of Hartley Bay. And you guys were the first to respond on onto that weren't yeah. you? Yeah, we got out here at 12.25 uh, a.m. is when the Mayday went out. We got out here, it took us about 40 minutes to get out. It was pretty dark night, rainy, you know, off and on. A little bit of wind and, and then Coast Guard was down in Bernard Harbor and they didn't get up here. It took them 90 minutes, I think, to get on scene. It took two years before people started to harvest when they were told it's safe enough for consumption. And what were you harvesting? Clams and cockles okay. and mussels, all of that stuff. But so I still wouldn't harvest nothing from here because there still is, they say, about one to four liters a day coming out of the ship every day. So we're sitting right over top the ferry right now. We're in about 1,400 feet of water.
We arrived at Herman and Janie's after that really long day and they just took real good care of us. Sort of like a fairy tale research story. They started a, uh, the Cetacea Lab on Gill Island, population two. So they've now set up a hydrophone network throughout the area, uh, underwater microphones that record uh, whale songs. Their entire property is lined with speakers emitting a constant sound of the underwater ocean sound. And that's what you can hear right now. That's all, that's all underwater sound that you're listening to. Within five minutes you know that there's a whale, you know where the whale is, and you know what kind of whale it is, and you haven't even left the lab. So it's a real great way to research whales without having such an impact on them. From a researcher's perspective, it's a huge opportunity to try and understand this humpback whale song, which is, it really is one of the great mysteries on the planet. Only the males are singing it, and it really is a song. When you listen to it, these whales literally go from verse to verse to verse. And then when they get to the end of the song, they'll go right back to the beginning and do it exactly the same all the way through. But then what happens as years go by, one male will make a change to the song, and for whatever reason we don't know why, all the males in the entire community will pick up that change and add it to their song. So at the beginning of the year, they're all singing one song. By the end of the year, they're all singing a different song, but they're all singing that exact same different song. Maybe what we can listen to is a... Um is, an, is a um, sample of what a tanker sounds like underwater in comparison to that. <laughs> yeah. and this is not even a, this is a normal small size tanker, one of those gear bulk tankers that go into Kilimanjaro. These super tankers, those VLCCs, are supposed to be the loudest tankers underwater. <coughs> and, um, we can hear these tankers up from, from where our hydrophone is in wheel channel. We can hear them up almost up to Parkley Bay, which is a distance of about 20 miles. And that we would take the risk of, de of devastating this area. And to be that short-sighted, um, I like to think we're better than that. The day after uh, was calling for some southeast storms and it worked out really well because it actually gave us, uh, the weather gave us a day of rest which we needed after that long day. Okay, on this beautiful morning, the Great Bear Rainforest, this is Kiel. In Kiel, they are harvesting seaweed and harvesting halibut for the month of May. So it's a really important time for the community. All the community members and youth come down. Kiel is, is still one of those areas where they've been harvesting traditionally for centuries and centuries. There was a lot going on in, in day six. We come around the corner and then it was just like, <laughs> it's like a cafeteria in like an elementary school somewhere. Spill or no spill, these kinds of places will change. Uh, and many of them won't survive just the presence of these tankers there. As I was making my way, the expedition was paddling down to Campania, I just heard some tail slaps. Um, and I, I, it was either humpback whale or, or killer whales. And once we got there, as I got closer, I could see that there were eagles and, and seagulls circling the area. And I knew that they were transient killer whales uh, because they had just made a kill on some type of uh, sea mammal. So here were four killer whales that had just made a kill right on the tanker route.
Transient killer whales are, are not very vocal because they hunt in stealth, but after they've made a kill, they will vocalize. And as soon as Herman heard that vocalization, he knew exactly what pod that was. continued on south and we made our way into Kamano Sound. This was a really important part of the expedition because this is where proposed tankers would be heading west across to Haida Gwaii. I could have ended the expedition there, I guess, uh, after just paddling the route, but it was very important to me to visit other communities that would be affected by the oil spill because oil spills are not local. If you look at the oil spill that happened in the uh, Gulf Coast down in Mexico, if you look at the oil spill in Alaska, those oil spills cover huge tracts of land and our whole coast will be affected by an oil spill, especially with the size of the tankers that they're proposing for this, for this uh, route. I remember we were looking at the map and I just, I couldn't believe how far out more islands were. And I actually said to Shannon, I was just like, does he know what he's doing? You know, like, who is this guy? I mean, this is a dreamy place. And to go there on a stand-up board um, is just, you know, off the hook. I think deep down, I didn't think I was actually going to get out there because I knew that the, the conditions out there can be extreme, can be very challenging. But after we woke up that morning on Anderson Island, it was flat calm. I could have spent a week there just looking at the intertidal life. Um, scallops. Uh, I saw my first abalone uh, was out at the Moore Islands. As rich an intertidal life as you can find anywhere. The whole wall is loaded with uh, urchin and plumos and enemies. I mean, an oil spill covers the whole coast. Everybody's affected. Everybody who lives on this coast is affected by that spill. And uh, most people, I'm very, very fortunate today because most people will never get a chance to see an area like this, especially this way. And then I knew our expedition had another three to four hour crossing to get back to one of the outer islands so that we could uh, lay our heads down that night. Clark was amazing. He's a guardian watchman in the Clem 2 area and he was training these young kids to, to become watchmen themselves. He took us into an area called Kitasu Bay and I think he wanted to take us to this area because he really wanted to show us what was at risk. He had looked up to us and said, this is Kitasu Bay. This is everything that we need uh, for our community is in this one bay. And if there was an oil spill and we had the northwest winds, which are predominant in the summertime, um, that oil will blow right into Kitasu Bay and it will wipe away everything that we have. Myers Passage is just lined with petroglyphs in tidal rock, um, pictographs. You could feel the energy and, and, and the spirit. You could almost see the old traditional canoes uh, passing through there. You know, he said, just walk to the top of that. There's a burial site up there. 
And, uh, you know, we went in and there was burial bones. So day nine, Brian and I woke up uh, in Myers Passage and we made our way into Clem 2. Inside the big house is like a 20 foot long hollow cedar pole that they use as a drum. The men of Clem 2 are incredible singers, very powerful singers and uh, that evening they had a feast and there were a number of songs that were sang. Uh, the dancing was, was incredible and powerful and there was a number of speakers that stood up. Which one of you guys running, uh, running cervical, I mean cervical? You, you were the crazy one, man. Eh? So the morning we left uh, Clem 2, I think actually, thinking back now, that might have been the day my ass really stopped hurting. And so we transitioned uh, from, from Clem 2, Kittisu territory, down into uh, Heltzik territory. You know, people ask me, it was a long journey. Some of the days were really long, and, and how, how was I able to do that? I accumulated strength as I went down the coast, talking to more and more people and realizing what I was paddling for and who, what, who I was paddling for. Uh, and in wanting to keep these tankers off the coast, it gave me a lot of strength. So by, by the time I got to that last day, I felt, uh, I didn't feel tired. I felt exhilarated, I felt excited. I felt I was ready to, to complete the journey. Happening. Oh, we're just gearing up for the last push to Bella Bella here. First bit of rain, really, on the whole trip. May 18th, we've completed the stand up for Great Bear Expedition. I was really impressed because I think word had gotten down the coast as to what was happening on our expedition. By the time we got to Bella Bella for the completion of our, our journey, there was a couple hundred people um, on the shoreline waiting for us to come in. I understand that you put in 10 hour days on this board and that's a, that's a, that's a big accomplishment and it tells us how serious you are about helping the coastal people with all our problems. And I'm really, really proud of you and uh, I welcome you to our, to our land. Thank you very much. Communities from up and down the entire pipeline route and up and down the coast uh, were all invited by the Gitgat and the Heisla. And really the first significant gathering of people around Enbridge. We say no to Enbridge oil. I was honored when Gerald Amos asked for me to do a ceremonial paddle in um, to start the day off. I got on my paddle board and um, paddled back into the community of Kitimat, uh, which was interesting because that's obviously where I left on the expedition. But instead of there being 25 or 30 people seeing us off, there was probably <laughs> two or three hundred people. We don't need on the they went out and harvested all the traditional foods to feed close to a thousand people at that feast. So there was everything that you could harvest from the ocean was on the table there. You know, 
we only remember that it's dangerous when an accident happens. But, you know, time has passed now and it's back to business as usual. And, uh, they've taken the moratorium in the Gulf away, so they want to expand more drilling down there. And our country, you know, we just elected a majority leadership to run this country right into the end of, you know, the oil age. We're here in Bella Bella right now. It's uh, one year pretty much after the uh, stand-up for Great Bear Expedition. The whole paddleboard idea came about when Norm Hahn last summer uh, did his incredible paddle from Kitimat down to Bella Bella. We started in September and it's been an incredibly massive project and we just basically wrapped up this past week in May and uh, we've completed 10 paddle boards and the students will be able to keep them and use them to explore their territorial waters. Um, it's a free way, silent way, efficient, um, and environmentally sustainable way to uh, explore around. Communities in the north have a sense of empowerment through their relationship with their landscape. There's a, there's a real sense that they can survive, that their culture has survived, that the world around them is safe and beautiful and providing for them, and, and that it will continue to do that if they just have a chance to take care of it. What's it like to lose everything you have? All the salmon runs, all the herring runs, uh, for the First Nations to lose completely everything. The wild salmon economy alone in the Skeena watershed was valued at over $120 million. That was almost 10 years ago. I mean, it's, it's an industry, it's a resource. Uh, you know, when I watched that film, it was just like, I felt so upset that that had already happened. And that's why I had to do something, because at least I could say I tried. At least I could say I tried. of crude could be leaking from the wellhead each and every day. Are you saying that right now there's no oil, no crude oil that's leaking from the wellhead? I am saying that there's no crude oil at this time leaking from the wellhead. Shannon is my youngest sister. Uh, her role on the trip was to uh, help with uh, the media, putting up blog posts, documenting the trip. I'm Brian Huntington and I work for the Skeena Watershed Conservation Coalition in Hazleton, BC. You know, he was on Ali Howard's Skeena swim and now here he was, um, you know, going to be meeting me in Kitimat to now paddle the tanker route. One of my jobs was to be Norm's support boat in the water, but also to photograph and film as much of his expedition and the interactions with the landscape and with the different communities. Area outside of Sudbury, I live in Squamish, BC now. The sport of stand-up paddleboarding is is new to Canadian uh, paddlers, Canadian people. Uh, originally, it uh, started in Hawaii. Uh, I started paddling about three years ago. 
Originally started working on the coast here in 2000 when I was hired at King Pacific Lodge. Um, since that time, uh, I've spent a lot of time in the community of, of Hartley Bay over those years as a, as a basketball coach, a teacher, working with uh, student mentor programs with the communities there. And in, uh, as a result of the work, I was adopted into the community in 2006 and given the name to Amlan, which means uh, Steerman of the Canoe. So it was a huge honour that was given to me. Um, and, and it also carried a big responsibility. Uh, Helen Clifton is a matriarch and leader within the community of, of Hartley Bay. I've learned uh, a lot from, from Helen Clifton. She came in every Wednesday and spoke to the kids about their culture and tradition. And uh, it was very inspiring. Our warmest regards to you for the journey that you're about to take. It's not an easy journey and we hope and pray and we know that our ancestors will be with you and guide you because we have a powerful message to send to the whole world on a tiny little board and this one man. Norm Pan and I'm from originally from Coniston on third kilometer long pipeline to Kitimat. Then they want to load up 225 tankers a year and take that oil through the Great Bear Rainforest, past these coastal communities, out across Hecate Strait, past Haida Gwaii, on its way to China. I knew I was going to do something uh, and it was to paddle the tanker route. I wanted to highlight the traditional food harvesting areas of the First Nations people along the tanker route and I wanted to document the wildlife through the Great Bear Rainforest and see for myself uh, what was going to be affected if there was going to be an oil spill. The Gulf spill happened in April and I couldn't believe what I was watching. Uh, the lack of response, uh, people not even knowing how much oil was spilling into the Gulf on a daily basis and then not knowing how to stop it. What's the status of that at, at, at the moment, Admiral? Because we, we had heard predictions from some officials that as much as 336,000 gallons... ...to listen to. She's an amazing storyteller. And so not only was she inspiring the students at that time, but she was really inspiring me. And I felt this really huge responsibility to want to do something. So she was a huge inspiration. We both picked up a newspaper clipping and it referred to a DVD called The Black Wave, The Legacy of the Exxon Valdez. And so I ordered it immediately. I watched that and uh, became very emotional. I actually broke down after I watched the film because I felt really bad for the people in Alaska. And I'd said to myself, this has already happened up there. And this is pretty much exactly what they want to do here on our coastline. They want to build that pipeline and they, then they want to take these tankers right, you know, basically past my front window where I was watching the film and I said no. Enbridge has proposed the Northern Gateway project which wants to take oil from the tar sands of Alberta along a 1200